now we will have Maya K. Van Rossum. She is the founder of the National Green Amendments for the Generations Movement and the organization. The organization and the movement is a push for people's rights towards clean air, water, and environment across the U.S. today. She will speak about the Green Amendment and why it's important to our future. So please welcome Maya K. Van Rossum. Thank you so, so much. It's really great to be here um, in the state of Michigan to talk about a Michigan Green Amendment. Right? The most important thing I want you to know about me is that I've been an environmental activist and attorney for about 30 years now. And it is through that 30 years of environmental activism and legal work that I've come to experience the myriad of ways our current system of environmental protection laws fundamentally fails us, fundamentally fails all of us when it comes to environmental protection, environmental justice, the climate, and protecting both present and future generations. And so I'm really here to talk to you about a new pathway for environmental protection. And I want to begin this talk with just reading a portion, not the full story, but a portion of one of the stories in um, my book that I think really helps bring home for people why it's so important to protect our environment. I call this, I don't call this, I mean the truth is, this is Gina's story. Gina was sick constantly, experiencing frequent gastrointestinal issues and hair loss that left her with permanent bald spots. Gina's daughter had been born with an extra ear. But nobody had endured greater suffering or paid a higher price for Mount Air's callously destructive actions and pollution than Gina's son, Kiwanis. Like Gina, Kiwanis had been born with asthma. His case was particularly severe. When your asthma is at its worst, it's like somebody put a plastic bag over your head and just pulled on a string and cut off all your air circulation, Gina says. He really suffered. He just suffered, she adds. When Kiwanis left Millsboro for a year to attend school, his condition seemed to improve significantly. But then he came home, and his asthma was once again a daily source of hardship. He struggled to keep it under control. On March 5, 2014, Gina got a frantic phone call. While hanging out in a house full of friends, Kiwanis had suffered an extremely severe asthma attack. They were calling an ambulance. She needed to drive immediately to the hospital. By the time Gina arrived, Kiwanis had passed away. He was just 24 years old. Now, this story took place in the state of Delaware. But the truth is, this story or any version of this kind of story happens here in Michigan almost every day, happens in every state across the United States of America. One just has to look at the news headlines to see how our environment, how communities, how people are suffering as a result of environmental pollution, degradation, and harm. And when people hear stories like this, they say, how is it possible? How is it possible that this would happen here in the United States of America? Don't we as people here in the United States have a right? Don't we have a right to clean water and clean air, a safe climate and healthy environments? Isn't that our right, not just by virtue of the fact that we are people here on this earth, but that by virtue of the fact that we are people here living in the state of Michigan, living in the United States? And the fact of the matter is, here in the United States, we have all kinds of rights. We have a right to free speech and freedom of religion. We have private property rights. We have civil rights. We have a right to bear arms. But we do not have environmental rights. We do not actually have a right to clean water, clean air, a safe climate, and healthy environments. They may be our human rights, but they are not our legal rights. Instead, what we have here in the state of Michigan and across the United States is a system of laws, a system of laws that presumes Pollution and environmental degradation is a necessary evil, something we must allow to happen. And as a result, we have a system of laws, we have a system of governance that is focused on permitting, legalizing, managing 
environmental pollution, degradation, and harm. We do not have a system of laws and governance that is focused on prevention, prevention of harm first. It is a system of laws and governance filled with gaps and loopholes. All kinds of industrial operations and contaminants evade regulation under this system of laws and governance very intentionally, either because a loophole has literally been written into the law or because there just is no law or regulation to deal with the issue. It's a system of laws and governance where environmental racism is alive and well and spans our states and our entire nation. It is a system of laws and governance where children are an afterthought. We hear from politicians and regulators all the time about our kids and how important it is to protect our kids. But when we actually look at the laws and the regulations in place, how they're interpreted and how they're implemented, children truly are the afterthought. It is a system of laws and governance where in the final analysis, the legislators and the regulators, the government officials, they're the ones who get to decide. They're the ones who decide what laws to pass, how to write those laws, what regulations to implement, how to interpret those laws, whether or not to enforce those laws in any given situation, despite the level of devastating harm a family or a community might be experiencing. And it is a system of laws and governance where industry has much greater access to the levers of power than the rest of us to help inform whether or not those laws get written, how they get written, how they get interpreted, and again, whether or not they even get enforced in a given situation. And as a result of this system of laws and governance, we have real people suffering real harm across Michigan and across our nation. And so we need to transform this system of laws and governance. We need transformational change. And just passing one more law, dealing with one more part of the problem, isn't going to do it. We need overarching and comprehensive reform when it comes to this system of environmental protection here in Michigan and across our nation. We need to reorient government so it is focused in the first instance on prevention of pollution, degradation, and harm. And we need to ensure that when there is a problem, when our government officials fundamentally fail us, fundamentally fail to protect our environment and our communities, that we the people have real meaningful power to do something about it. Not just electing somebody else to future office that we can hope will do the right thing, but having real power to be able to create meaningful change in the moment when something is going wrong. And I suggest to you that what we need to do is we need to give constitutional standing to environmental protection and to our environmental rights. Now, if we want to give constitutional, meaningful constitutional protection to our environment and our environmental rights, not just any language will do. And we know that because actually almost every state constitution across our nation talks about the environment, talks about environmental protection, even talks about environmental rights. But there are only three states at this point, Pennsylvania, Montana, and most recently the state of New York, that truly give highest constitutional recognition protection, enforceable protection to our environment and our environmental rights. All right, so we know we need, there's certain criteria that have to be met to get that highest legal standing. These are criteria that I have identified um, and when, when, when they are fulfilled, it means that a constitutional amendment fulfills the definition of what I call a green amendment. A green amendment is the most powerful kind of constitutional recognition and protection for the environment and environmental rights that we can have in our nation. It is essential if you actually want to have meaningful and enforceable constitutional level protection for the environment. So what are those criteria? Well, first and foremost, the language has to be placed in the Bill of Rights or Declaration of Rights section of the Constitution. That's where we recognize and protect all of those other fundamental rights we hold dear. If we want to give highest constitutional standing to our environment, we have to place it in that same section of the Constitution. We have to be clear about what we're protecting. 
the environmental essentials of life. Water, air, climate, soils, flora, fauna, ecosystems. We have to ensure that all government officials at every level of government, not just the state legislature, but the local town council, the regulators, the attorney general, the governor, everybody is constitutionally bound to protect our environment and our environmental rights. And they are constitutionally bound to protect these rights for all people equitably, regardless of race, ethnicity, tribal affiliation, wealth, socioeconomic status. A Green Amendment provides meaningful generational protection, where both present and future generations, children yet to be born, are given meaningful, substantive, enforceable protection. The best Green Amendments identify our state as the trustee of our state's natural resources, with an obligation to protect those resources for the benefit of we, the people. We, the people are the primary beneficial, beneficiaries of the work that they must do to protect our environment and our environmental rights. When we pass, when we place into our state constitutions and ultimately also in our federal constitution, this kind of green amendment, language and protection, we empower the law and we empower the people of our state. We really do lift up environmental rights so they are given highest constitutional standing. The fact of the matter is we all know how powerfully our right to free speech, our right to freedom of religion, our private property rights are protected. We all know how powerfully the right to bear arms is protected because it is in the Bill of Rights section of our state and federal constitutions, protected with carefully crafted language. Well now, with the passage of a Green Amendment, that same highest constitutional protection comes to bear for the environment and our environmental rights. When we pass a Green Amendment right, we give that highest protection. With the passage of a Green Amendment, all government action, all government action, must protect the environmental rights of the people, and again, it must protect those environmental rights equitably, right? All of the existing laws that are already on the books are now strengthened. They don't get wiped away or displaced, as some people will suggest to you. They get strengthened. Now, when government officials, when regulators are interpreting a law that says they have to protect the clean water, well, now the term clean is being defined and interpreted through the lens of how does this, how do I interpret and define this terminology in service to ensuring that I, a government official, am protecting the right of the people, the constitutional right of the people, to clean water, right? So it changes how existing laws are interpreted and applied, because now it's all through the lens of using those laws in service to meeting the constitutional obligation. It creates a powerful foundation for new laws, right? So when we have good government officials that want to make good decisions, do the right thing, they now have constitutional standing for that um, protective effort they want to undertake. That protective effort may be about passing a law, it may be about passing a new regulation, but it might also be about whether or not to issue a permit for some highly polluting industrial operation. When we have a Green Amendment, the gaps, the loopholes, the deficiencies in the law can be addressed. Because even if there is no law that's addressing a problem, for example, PFAS contamination, or in those instances when the law, as interpreted, as applied, as enforced, results in environmental racism, results in so much pollution, degradation, and harm that we've got water so contaminated it's giving kids cancer, well, now people can turn to their constitutional entitlement to a clean, safe, and healthy environment to take meaningful action against their government officials to get the protections they need, the constitutional protections they are now entitled to. With the passage of a Green Amendment, our goal is to get our government officials to do better to render better decisions so we're all better protected. But the reality of a Green Amendment is that when our government officials fundamentally fail us, we the people can get access to the courts to do something about it. And it's not just about transforming the law. It's also about empowering people, empowering those who are fighting for the environment, whether you're an activist like me or just an everyday person who cares about this 
project or program or industrial operation that's about to go in down the road, right? Because now, when we are standing up to advocate for our environment, to advocate for our communities and our families, we are fighting for the people and the environments we love, but we are also fighting for a constitutional entitlement. And here in the United States of America, when you are fighting for a constitutional right, whether or not people agree with you or disagree with you, they view you differently. Because now it's not just a matter of a difference of opinion. It's now a matter of constitutional right. And it transforms the conversation. Right? It's no longer so easy when somebody gets up to advocate for the environment to say, oh, you're just a tree hugger. You're just a fish lover. You're a job killer or a people hater. Or as one fur commissioner said about me and my colleagues, you're an eco jihadist. <laughs> they can't say that anymore because now you know what you are? Now what you are is you are a true US patriot that's rising up for the constitutional right to a clean, safe, and healthy environment that belongs to each and every one of us. It changes the nature of the conversation, right? Everybody who gets up to advocate for the environment, first words out of their mouth, I have a right. And those government officials that are on the decision-making dais, they no longer so quickly and easily, some of them do, but many of them no longer so quickly and easily pick up their little machines, right, their little phones, and start doing their texting or their social mediating, right? Because now they know they took an oath of office to uphold a constitution that includes your right to a clean, safe, and healthy environment. This is a nationwide movement that's advancing at the state level first. We are going state by state by state, seeking and securing constitutional protection of our environmental rights. But ultimately, ultimately, we need a federal green amendment as well, because the state constitution applies to state government officials. But we also do need a federal constitution that will apply to our federal government officials. But the states have a lot of power, Constitutional amendments at the state level are very accessible and very doable, so we're starting with the states first. And it's not uncommon for the, some of the most proactive movements, the suffragette movement began with state action first and went to the federal government second. Well, when I first began this talk, when I founded this movement in 2014, there were actually only two states then, Pennsylvania and Montana, that had a constitutional green amendment. Now we have three states that have a constitutional green amendment. We have 15 states where an amendment has been proposed, and we've got a couple more where we're anticipating them, and even several more where I'm working with activists to start to get things to happen. And we are anticipating a Green Amendment here in the state of Michigan, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Michigan is emerging as a true leader in the National Green Amendment movement. And the real thing is, if, if uh, Michigan can get things into gear, Michigan could be, could be the fourth state in the nation to recognize and protect the right of all people to a clean, safe, and healthy environment, and could actually be the first state, the first state in the nation to explicitly recognize the right to a safe climate. Right. So I'm going to finish with one final reading from the book that I think um, sums it up for me, hopefully uh, for you. No matter where you happen to live, I'm here to say that you should dramatically raise your expectations when it comes to the environment. You have a right to pure water, clean air, a stable climate, and healthy environments. This right is inherent and indefeasible. It belongs to you. Many politicians rail against entitlements and dismiss millennials as an entitled generation. But they've got it wrong. Entitlement is not a dirty word. It is a recognition of rights. And make no mistake, when it comes to the environment, you are entitled. So I want to thank you for joining me today to pursue a constitutional freedom amendment here in the state of Michigan.